Okay, so I think we're, I think we're live. It's one o'clock. So, hello everyone. Um, uh, thank you for joining the second session of Transform Startup and Scale Up. Um, my name is David, and I will be the uh, the MC for today's session. So, as you know, um, the Transform series it's a free online seminar series that explores the growing impact of digital transformation on business and society. Uh, we'll be covering a total of six areas ranging from the future of work to smart cities and communities, the circular economy and many more. Um, today, however, we're looking at the second of these by focusing on the startup and scale-up space. So um, we are delighted to be joined by two people, two guests today, uh, Patrick Gary, a CEO of Loyalab, and Stephen Deese, he's a co-founder of Bear Market Coffee. And they'll be telling us about their experiences with online and offline sales for uh, startup and scale up companies. So first I'll hand over to Patrick and Patrick is the co-founder and CEO of Loyal App, a platform to help physical presence businesses engage and reward customers while becoming more data driven in their operations. And then after Patrick, uh, we'll have uh, Stephen DC. So Stephen is the co-founder of Bear Market Coffee. Um, a, a, it's a coffee community. It's more than just, a, 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 I think, uh, Stephen, a series of um, uh, coffee shops. It's a community that you've grown and scaled from your first location in Black Rock um, to five locations throughout Dublin city centre. And along the way, Bear Market has invested in digital technology for things like customer loyalty, mobile payments, online ordering, and it's culminated in the release of your own custom branded app last year so um without so what i'll say is so feel free everyone listening to send your questions use the q a button uh the q a function down the bottom of the screen uh, so chat is disabled for this okay so we can only use the q a and so without further delay i'll hand you over to patrick thank you patrick thanks david uh, am i coming through loud and clear you are yeah okay cool uh Great. Well, I'll jump straight in and give an overview of what Loyal Apps is from, uh, from its original foundation to what it is today, uh, how that works with Bear Market, and then uh, open it up to Stephen to talk about how uh, what we've done for them or how useful the product is uh, for an actual customer. So at the highest level, Loyal App is a suite of tools for physical presence businesses to help them digitally enhance. So what, what we saw back in, in 2012 when we started the business was that a lot of the larger players in the market, uh, specifically Starbucks at the time, had just launched a loyalty application. And it was quite basic at the time, it just did loyalty. But what myself and my co-founder saw was that this is a... Um, this is a development that's going to perforate every aspect of real world businesses and it's not just going to be the likes of starbucks that have this technology every every business in the world is going to want to have technology like this so we set about uh on a mission to build these services as a platform where small businesses could get involved uh, for a very low starting price and then could scale up the technology that they want to use inside of their business. So we know it's never a one size fits all approach. We know that there's not one perfect solution for every business. So the way that we went about building it was to build out a suite of tools and give businesses the choice to mix and match what actually works best in their operation. Uh, I don't want to scroll. Too much scrolling. Can I just click? Sorry, it's, all I can do is scroll, so it's uh, scrolling a bit too much. Patrick, I can actually scroll for you if you want to. It's not going to Yeah, work. if you could just go to the next slide. Yeah, of course, no problem. Uh, so, a lot of our customers at the time uh, 
a market development was coming around where points of sale systems were changing back in 2012 and 2013. And we saw this really as our opportunity because prior to that, our, our first solution was actually a tablet based application. So it was very simple, very simple tablet app. There was a merchant app, so a business would have their own login. And then there was a member application or a user application. So a, a customer, a customer of our customer could earn loyalty points. And, and that was the height of it, really. It could take up a certain amount of points and then the merchant could redeem those points. That was, uh, that was our beta trial. We had about 20 businesses testing that. And after those 20 businesses, the feedback was generally positive. So like 10 of those businesses continued to use it and were, and were willing to pay for it. But the constant piece of feedback was that no business wants more clunky stuff at their point of sale. Uh, and not only the physical aspect of it, they also, they wanted all and Stephen can correct me if I'm wrong when he speaks later, but they want it all integrated into one place for easier management. They don't want to be going here for their point of sale and here for their loyalty system and over there for online ordering, and then to be managing five or six different service providers that aren't integrated. What we saw was that if we integrated directly into the point of sale at a product level, we could provide all of these auxiliary services on top of the pods, meaning no additional hardware for the merchant, and also meaning that all of the customers and all of the data would be in one place. Uh, to the next slide, Molly, please. So in, in terms of timeline, that happened. So the company was established in 2012, late 2012. We didn't really do anything until 2013. Uh, and that's when we came up with the tablet application. So for any, any budding entrepreneurs in the audience, like that would be our general recommendation of a first step is to try and get some validation of a product, no matter how basic it was. Because if, if we hadn't have taken those steps, even to build that very basic tablet application, we would have never spotted the opportunity to do the point of sale system. So often the first steps are, are, are what are going to lead you in the right direction to find the rest and you have to start somewhere. But in 2014, that's when we started to grow. So that's when we did our first point of sale integration. Uh, which then meant that our software was just downloadable as an app. So a customer like Bear Market could download a gift cards app or they could download loyalty or they could download online ordering. And then all of these different applications work together. Uh, as a bit of a divergence in, in 2016, we kind of figured out uh, that our suite of technology, so cashless payments, gift cards, online ordering was actually perfectly suited to a, a different market, which was closed loop payments in corporate environments. Uh, so one of the things that we did to grow as a business at that time was we then started appealing to two different market verticals, which was, uh, was very difficult from a branding perspective, because then at that point, the company took on two different missions. There was one, the Loyal App mission, which is to digitize phys physical presence retailers to help bring more and more technology to small businesses to help them compete against the largest in the market. But then by virtue of all that technology we created, we kind of stumbled ourselves perfectly into this other market, which was closed loop payments. And suddenly we started getting contracts for small employers that started going up. And then suddenly we got the central bank. So we were doing all the payments inside the central bank. Oh, again, like no, the technology, literally the exact same. Uh, just a different utilization. So whereas in bear market, people pay using the bear market app. In the central bank, they link their staff card to the app. So there's just a, an NFC link that happens and then all the payments happen with the staff card. So it's a, it's a tap to pay rather than a scan to pay, but exact same underlying technology. So we kept driving sales on that for a while uh, until eventually in 2018, we made the decision that the two companies had to be run separately because it was too much of a mix match in terms of vision and in terms of product development. And we needed to kind of officially split time between development on both companies. So we split out the whole cashless side of the business into another business called FacilityPay, uh, which now has its own managing director and 
basically goes out into the markets where it's focusing in the UK and the US and, and Ireland to just continue to sell. Uh, the irony is that the biggest customers that we have, these massive employment facilities, they're generally very happy with the service. They, they pretty much have everything that they want from a functionality perspective. It's actually the smaller businesses that are way more demanding in terms of what they want. And that's mainly because there's so many of them, but that's what we originally started with. And that's what we want the company to be. We always wanted to focus on the opportunity of being the technology provider into the SMEs. So splitting facility pay, let me focus on that, but also let the team focus on that. And it also helped our marketing team quite a lot as well, because we were having a nightmare trying to define what the business was. You're like, well, if you're providing a loyalty system to this cafe over here, and then you're doing all the payments in the central bank here, like what, what are you? So we had to answer that question. And the only solution we had, which was the best solution was to, to split them out. Uh, and so after that, we continued and now we had two businesses and then COVID struck this year, uh, which basically we dropped all tools and we started to focus exclusively on the online stuff that we do. So no more development on in-store loyalty or, or in-store payments. It was all about two primary functions that we have. So selling digital gift cards. So a, a, a business can get online with Loyal App. They can start selling gift cards via email with those emails having a QR code that can be redeemed at the point of sale. Uh, as well as one thing we worked really closely with Bear Market on, uh, and we're still working to bring in more and more features, was online ordering. So we had an older online ordering product, which was quite basic. Uh, and with COVID, we just saw this vast acceleration of digitization of businesses. And we just saw that our older product just wasn't sufficient anymore. So we put all of our engineering efforts onto enhancing our online ordering uh, over the last year. And it's, it's paid off quite a lot because now we have a very feature rich functionality where businesses can have different products available at different times of the day, can have related products, can have allergens, can have special offers redeem with online orders. So it has, uh, it has paid off and we will continue to renew focus on that into, into the next year. Uh, next slide, please, Molly. Cool. Uh, like I've kind of been in, uh, reiterating once or twice, Loyal App is about letting people and merchants find the perfect way to pay. So we understand that there's no one size fits all approach. So in Bear Market, for example, most of their customers, uh, about 70% or so, they pay with their debit card and then they earn their loyalty on their phone. So they tap their card and then the QR code on their app gets scanned. The transactions merge together. The loyalty points go back onto the consumer's account. But there's also 30% of customers who have their cards linked to their app and actually just pay directly with their app. Uh, there's other customers where, say, one of our largest customers in the UK is Ballantyne Gyms. So they have 100 gyms. And their focus was, we have all these gyms, we have vending machines, coffee machines, bars, like protein bars uh, inside and, and nobody's buying them because nobody's bringing cash to the gym. So, and people aren't bringing card to the gym either. So what do we do? And their solution was, uh, well, with us was silicone wristbands that were branded to that business that have an RFID chip inside of them. So exact same scenario as our, our cashless facility pay customers where they pay with their staff card, which has RFID. These silicone wristbands had RFID and now the members in Bannatine gyms, when they go in, this band can unlock the door to let them in, can unlock their locker. And these are separate companies. We've, we've nothing to do with that. We just partner with these guys. But when it comes to the payment aspect, we do everything there. Uh, and their sales increased by a multitude of four or five in the year or two after we implemented this because well, prior to this, there was no way for customers to pay. So for Ballantyne, we came up uh, with the perfect way for payments in their, in their facility. And that's the way that we see it going into the future. Like it's, 
we don't see that there's going to be one payment type. There's, it's not going to be everybody, everybody's eye is going to be scanned at the point of sale or everybody's fingerprint or, or anything like that. We see it more as a, as a choice-based model. Like, uh, I'm not sure how good my camera is, but if you look at my watch strap, that's, this is a Loyalab strap that we've got made recently that has an RFID chip just behind that L. So that's linked to my account. So any place where I go to that has Loyalab, all I have to do is touch that watch strap that recognizes my account to the point of sale, processes the transaction, processes all the loyalty points. So all of these complex transactions are happening in the background. So we take all of the complication onto our shoulders as a business as much as we possibly can. So the consumer experience is literally walking in the door, tapping your, your watch uh, and getting your product. In fact, with Bear Market, we were just before COVID about to launch contactless keep cups. So they have uh, keep cups in Bear Market and we had new ones, uh, new bands made essentially that had, again, RFID chips inside of them. So the vision was you could just hand over your cup, the cup would be tapped against the reader at the point of sale to take the payment, you then fill it up and then off you go. So you don't need to take card, cash or your phone to bear market, you just need to take your keep cup. And unfortunately that's had to go on hold because of COVID, but it is something we'll be launching uh, with the guys next year. So again, all about seamless and all about choice, letting people pay the way that they want. Next slide please, Mom. Uh, so I've, I've spoken about a few of these features already, but when you look at Loyalap from its, from, its, uh, from its core, it has four main pieces of functionality. So it has click and collect and delivery options. So a merchant integrated into their point of sale and integrated into a white label application can allow customers to order for delivery uh, or for collection. We don't provide delivery services, like we don't provide any drivers. But if a business has their own driver, our services can integrate with those to let the customers know where, where the product should be going. App payments as a major focus of it, which pretty much all of our customers use. We also have self-service kiosks. Uh, this is where we use them in, um, in Dublin airport for selling fast track, as well as in a few restaurants in the United States and in the UK where People can essentially walk up to the point of sale, select their own products. Those products are then sent behind the counter. So it, it, a self-service model essentially and gift cards. And the way that we think about Loyalab is if you take these four pieces of functionality, behind this is the loyalty CRM. So the tracks and rewards all of the spending on the system. And by combination of bringing all of this together, that's what is that that is the Loyalab platform. You know, you can start small. Most of our merchants just start with gift cards. Uh, and then once they see what the gift cards can do, they become curious about the other stuff. Uh, and that's essentially how we upsell our customers by selling something that they understand today. Uh, that's another nugget of advice for any budding entrepreneurs as well that we found was it can be very difficult to sell something that only you know you understand or you have a vision of so what's a lot easier to do is to build something that you know there's already a market for there's already a very clear market for gift cards we just came up with a a nicer version of that that was more cost effective and that included several digital elements like digital gift cards and then that became the attraction for all of our new customers and then once they see what the gift cards can do they become curious as to the other technologies. Uh, and that's something that's going quite well for us as well. To the next slide, Mon. Cool. Uh, yeah, so when people ask us like what differentiates us, so th there actually are quite a lot of companies that do gift cards and online ordering. So many companies doing online ordering. There's a few doing self-service kiosks, but our USP as a business is how we make all of these available on one platform. That's one USB, but behind that is our loyalty rewards platform. And that's really what we've been working on since day one, and you know, hence the name Loyalap. It was always our understanding that physical presence of retailers, one of the biggest differentiators between you know, a bear market, a real world bear market and an online bear market, say if bear market was online only, 
would be if bear market was online only, they would know every single one of their customers. You know, they would know how many times people are reordering because by virtue of the fact that you're ordering online, you need to put in your details in order for the product to be shipped to you. So the business has quite a lot of information in terms of their customers and who their most valuable customers are. Real world businesses don't have that. You, you can walk into most real world businesses and they have, they have little idea who their best customers are. They may know who their top five are just by face. But you know, in terms of the Pareto principle in business where you know, 80% of your revenues can come from 20% of your customers, there's no way any business can, you know, in their mind, you could record that amount of people. So we understood that loyalty is a quid pro quo, just as it has been since Tesco uh, established the first really modern loyalty system in the early 90s with their club card. And the quid pro quo is you get rewards and offers based on your purchases as long as you're willing to share that with the business so that they can get smarter about their operations, you know, in a way that perfectly protects everybody's privacy. This isn't about selling people's data to anybody. Loyalap never sell data. It's in our terms and conditions that we'd never sell a merchant's data to anybody, but it's about you're transacting with this business. You like this business. Why don't you help this business get a bit smarter about its operations and understand its customers. And if you join the loyalty program, that's exactly what's going to happen. And over the years, we've enhanced the loyalty program again and again and again. Uh, and I'll let Stephen speak about some of the things they use it for. But it's now got to the point where we're starting to talk about it in terms of programming your business. So with Loyalab's campaigns, which is our loyalty engine, you can program triggers that then automatically apply to customers based on those triggers. So for example, if it is your birthday or if it's the week of your birthday or the day of or the day in between, then you can give the client X, you know, X could be 10% off, X could be two euros off or X could be a specific product like a, like a bun, you know? So in bear market, they do a birthday reward where you get a free coffee on your birthday. Uh, you can do rewards to specific accounts. You know, Stephen's a very generous guy and his dad gets free coffee in bear market. And he does that by virtue of the fact that he just adds that person's account number into the CRM system. And then when that account number is recognized at the point of sale, the loyal app system knows to discount that transaction appropriately. But there's no, there's no, well, there is limitations, but there's very few limitations in terms of the scope of this sort of functionality. And this is where we really want to drive our business further. So uh, helping businesses in terms of lapsed customers. So you can program it that if a, if a customer spent greater than X with your business, but hasn't visited in Y period, then send a specific offer to that customer to try to get them back in the door. You know, maybe they had a bad experience with somebody. So Loyalty is the means by which real world businesses become data driven. There's no other way around it in our view. Like in order to get the required data at the point of transaction, you need to give something back to the customer. And that is a loyalty system. It, it was established, like I said, by the modern version by Tesco in the 90s. Uh, Starbucks improved on it in the 90s with the, with the mobile aspect. And we're now looking to merge both sides of those together, giving small businesses access to leading app technology and analytics technology while taking all of the complex work on loyal apps engineering shoulders so that the user experience for a business going in and creating these complex rewards is as simple as can possibly be. Uh, to the next slide, please, Molly. Cool. Uh, and I suppose like every business is judged on some sort of metric and, and we have several uh, you know, customer happiness metrics, functionality metrics, uh, but ultimately there's one metric that really drives our business and it's, we test it all the time with all of our businesses uh, and it's how much more do customers spend who use the app, who, who pay with the app, than customers who pay with cash or cart. And the average result is anywhere between 16 and 24%, you know, 22% specifically in the cafe verticals. And that's what, that's what drives us because 
at the end of the day, we could be offering a loyalty system to merchants that just gives back too much to the consumer and doesn't have this benefit to the merchant. And if the merchant doesn't see that people spending with the app spend more often and spend more frequently, then you know what are we really doing for them? So we have to prove our work. And that is the biggest measure of how we prove our work to our customers. So next slide, please, Molly. Cool. Uh, yeah, and just a note on support, uh, especially with small businesses, like support is one of the key aspects and, and we continue and invest in it. You know, what we would call, we don't really call our customer support team customer support. Ideally, there shouldn't be much support. You know, support is when something goes wrong. Uh, and of course, we're there when something goes wrong. But how we see it nowadays and how a lot of customers see it is in terms of customer success. So there's no point building all this stuff if you don't get anybody to use it. Right? There's, there's no shortage and it's ever growing uh, of tech companies and pieces of software that you know, just excellent pieces of technology just didn't have commercially viable models or just didn't have people that use them. And then all of this hard work, billions of hours from millions of people is just gone to waste now and nobody's doing it. We wanted to make sure that that would never happen with our technology. So we understood the importance of having people as intermediaries as well. So using technology to augment this so that we became more efficient with chatbots and things like that. But at the end of the day, we, we do understand that business owners, when you're selling B2B as opposed to B2C, business owners in particular do like to have easy access to somebody the other end of the phone. They're not gonna, they're not gonna inundate you un unless it's required, but they, they need to have that human approach that can translate your technology to them so they can use it best because it, it can become very easy for someone like me to become so accustomed to my own technology that it just becomes second nature and I just assume that people are going to understand it, but that's not the case. You need to have really good customer success people in place that can take your technology, translate that message to your, to your merchants and make sure that they're getting the most out of your system. There's no point working this hard to get the product in the door only for the merchant then to not understand it or to not use it. You know, that was never a problem with bear market, but we have thousands of customers and this is something that when a customer onboards with us, we have several metrics to make sure that they're doing their first transactions, they're setting up these things appropriately in the database, they're doing X, Y, and Z. And if they're not doing those things, you know, an email isn't going to get them to do it. And an email is very easily ignored by a small business owner because they're ludicrously busy. So it has to be a person who's there like, I will make this easy for you. I will get this started for you. And I will just nudge you along in the right direction. This doesn't mean that we're going to have to do absolutely everything for you, but you know, right now you need some help to get started. Uh, so again, any any budding entrepreneurs out there? I'm a big fan of customer success and customer support. And unless you're Google or Facebook, you're not going to get away with not providing that. Uh, I think that's it, Molly. I've no other slides, do I? That's great. Thanks very much, Patrick. I, I have one question here from from um, from the audience. If I could, if I if I ask you, yeah, yeah. So it's uh, how did COVID nineteen affect Loyal App? So it boosted one side of the business and destroyed another. Uh, so like the facilitating side of things just went a standstill. So all of the corporate. The office buildings where we do all the payments internally, they're all shut, so not many of those are right now. So we freeze on that and And specifically, we focused it all on the online order side of things. So Yeah. 
for years. Mm -hmm. I think, I think the sound went just a little bit patchy at the end. Um, that's, a, that's fine. We have a, a, a couple of questions here. Um, someone's asking, uh, has Loyalap expanded much outside major cities such as Dublin, Cork, Galway? I think there. I think your audio is uh, is patchy. I couldn't hear that last one, um, Patrick. So I'll, I'll tell you what. We have a couple of questions, but what we'll do is maybe if we hand over to um, to Stephen, and maybe at the end uh, we can come back to the questions for, for you, Patrick. So uh, Stephen is the co-founder of uh, of uh, the Bear Market. Uh, Stephen, are you? Yeah, I'm gonna pass over to you. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, I suppose. Uh, Patrick's gone through a lot of it there. We've been with Patrick since uh, pretty much the very start. Um, when myself and my wife Ruth set up Bear Market, we initially set it up in a little archway in, in Blackrock Market, and we were using small little paper loyalty cards. Um, but what I found is people were losing them. People didn't want them in their wallets. Um, and from our end as well, we found you end up just tapping away for some customers, and it just there was no there was no um, continuity to the whole thing. We were also very focused at the time. We said we want to kind of push Bear to be a technology driven coffee chain um, and try and integrate the two. So obviously, what is a traditionally a bricks and mortar business, but try and integrate with something that that is is driving. The, the informative technology aspect forward. And that's the, the big thing for us with Loyalap. Um, as Patrick kind of was, was talking about there, it, it allows us to get to know the customers. Um, even from sitting here in the office, I get to know what customers are, are using the system. We get to see um, who is using it the most. We get to know in terms of their, their favorite coffees. Um, and things like that and then it allows us to to delve even deeper and sorry if i'm, I'm kind of meandering all over here because there's, there's a lot of functionality funnily enough to to the system when you start writing it down but yeah it allows us to 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 differentiate ourselves from our competitors essentially so if if someone comes in sets up an account with us a, a loyalty account loyal app they essentially scan scan the app they'll get a monetary figure back onto their app. So not just a stamp or a star, they essentially will get, let's say 30 cent back in credit onto their app. And that allows them to either come back in and use that against another coffee, or they can use that against a, an AeroPress or a bag of coffee or a, anything we sell essentially. And that to me um, was a big driving force in the early days because it, suddenly this is a this is a massive differentiator between us and our competitors. Everyone else is just in coffee. We're suddenly saying, okay, now you can use the bear market slash loyal app, app as a savings account. You can use that and use it for a rainy day. You can you have your eye on the grinder. It it, it allows you to save up for that. 
Um, so that's that's initially was a great driving force. And then obviously as time has gone on, the functionality has increased. Um, with COVID, obviously we've had, we've closed all our shops except two at the moment, Pembroke Street and Black Rock. And as a result, we've, we've shifted the business like a lot of our, our, um, our competitors shifted the business online, which is doing a, a good bit of, of turnover now at the moment. But one of the brilliant things with it is A, we had we, a list of thousands and thousands of, of customers who are loyal bear market customers. And we already had that through, through Loyola. So when we launched the website, we were able to literally say, send an email to all these guys and say, we've now launched this website. We're going to do X promotions, whatever it is we're going to do. And straight away, the traffic on the website took a massive spike. Um, and because they are the loyal, loyal customers, that straight away um, process to, to purchases. So that, that at the moment is a, a huge element for us. It's a huge bit. Um, we've also integrated with that the, the gift cards into the website so people can come in on the website and they can buy gift cards for, for, per, for in-store gift cards. So it kind of cross-meshing the, uh, the functionality of both. So the, the bricks and mortar face-to-face -face business is now moving towards that, that online side. And we couldn't have done that with a traditional loyalty system just wouldn't have worked. Um, one of the other things as well that it, that's really great at the moment is we're working on different campaigns through our social media in terms of um, kind of bear market ambassadors or champions. So we kind of pick a number of different people who might be a really, really loyal customers come into us multiple times a day. They might be a sports personality who comes into us or a number of different people and we basically have sat down with them we said listen we, we love the fact you come to us you're really really loyal we'd love to offer you either two free coffees a day or we'd love to offer you 50 percent off this or whatever it may be and then that allows us to to drive different campaigns through our social media and again something that just couldn't have been done with a traditional um gift card or traditional loyalty card um and I know I'm missing a load of things here <laughs> because I'm kind of, I'm rattling them off as, as I remember the, what, what we do, but uh, there's a lot more to it than that. But I think if you were to take one thing from this and um, for us, what we love about Loyal App, it's, it's just the integration. It's the constant, I, I'm sure Patrick's fed up with me. I'm, I'm, I'm always uh, ringing or nagging about different ideas and different things we can do with it. But because the, the foundations are there, um, the integration is there. It's quite easy, and I'm sure Patrick would argue otherwise, but uh, to add extra functionality to it. So if we're sitting down and we're saying, you know what, this would be a great idea, let's run this promotion. More often than not, I ring Patrick and he says, listen, give me a few weeks and we can get that done. And that, that's a huge um, benefit to us as a retailer, and especially as things get harder and harder, more competitive, um, all these little elements are, are vital. So that's that's kind of it. Um, is there any other things, Patrick? Do you think that I've I've kind of glossed over, or forgotten there? So I'm sure there probably nope. is. I think that your your audio audio is gone, Patrick. Unfortunately, Patrick, your audio is is um is gone. Actually, one of one of the other things while we're waiting for Patrick to sort that, um, we just opened a new store there well, six months ago in the Catalan out in Ballymun. And one of the great benefits for, for us um, is we, their staff there essentially get a, a discounted price on coffee. But a big incentive for them and what we, we a value add for them is we said, listen, you guys set up with the Loyal App system and they can go into any of our stores all around the city and they can use their agreed upon discount in any store. So again, it's another just kind of shift on the, the functionality of the app, but it was a great, um, great value add for us when, when we were talking to the Catalan. It's one of the things where I would say, listen, we can offer you this. And again, it's, it's just, it's a fairly unique thing that was very easy to integrate across all our stores. And we're now, well, so we have two open, but hopefully by the end of September next year, we'll back up to potentially seven or eight shops. So, 
that would typically be quite hard to roll out. But with this, it literally is just click a few keys on a keyboard and, and we have that integration in all the stores. Hey, can you guys hear me again? That's better now, yeah. Yeah, Patrick. Great. Um, so, couple, uh, so I'll, I'll ask the audience, are there, uh, if there's any questions for Stephen um, and Bear Marcus, uh, please ask them. I have a couple here for, um, uh, for you, uh, Patrick. Uh, so here's one. Do you see yourself as a competitor to Square or Clover, or are you positioned more as a product that could be integrated into those POS systems? The latter. Uh, so like Bear Market uses Clover. So we're integrated with Clover uh, and a couple of other point of sale systems. We're not currently integrated with Square, but we will be. Uh, but yeah, our strategy is to integrate with as many of these point of sale systems as is possible. Uh, but strategically, we had a choice uh, years ago and it was either dilute the product. So like Steven says, we're pretty good at being able to release features and functionality relatively quickly. Uh, we've built the technology stack that way. And it, it works for us because we can keep our customers happy that way. Like the, the demands on the technology are always rising. We could have years ago chosen to do lots of point to sale integrations, but with a weaker product. So Obviously, we have a finite amount of resource, so there's only so much we can engineer. So had we chosen to do 20 point of sale integrations, our online ordering wouldn't be where it is today. Our campaign, Stephen wouldn't be as happy with the product. It would be, it would be more okay in his eyes, you know, and, and there, there would have been the risk that a competitor would have come in and just beaten us on the functionality, and then we would have been nowhere. So we decided to focus exclusively on Clover and, and three other point of sale systems at the start and to not do anything else. Uh, only now are we setting our eyes next year onto doing quite a lot because we feel like we have a really good product market fit now, but years ago we didn't. But no, uh, Square, Revel, Clover, uh, and about 20 others, they're not competitors, they're routes to market. That's how we get. But mm. if you know the space, some of those point of sale systems have their own loyalties, uh, gift cards, online ordering right. solutions. But the reality is the CEOs and the C-suite and these organizations, they don't care about our business as much as we do. They care about point of sale. Mm. Uh, so when our business like CRM is one way of looking at us, like complete customer management, that's all we think about. And, and we think there's a massive business in this just in and of itself. We've no interest in point to sale systems. Some point to sale systems take the strategy that they should own our type of technology as well. But by virtue of the fact that it's gone down three layers from management to middle management, some of whom may not agree with even doing this, the products end up being relatively fair, you know, to good, uh, not excellent. Sure. So, they may spend hundreds of millions, whereas we spend millions and we end up with a better product. So it's it's about focus there. So sure. they're, so they're not competitors, but some of them do release competing products, but most of them are open to third parties like us hmm. being on their app markets because we have to pay them, a, we pay them a commission for being there. So I have two kind of uh, related questions on um, rewards and loyalty so you see like the encroachment into that space so revolut uh, visa so how do you i suppose you know assess the impact of that or is it something of a concern how do i worry about visa and mastercard well, just in terms of the, the the rewards and the loyalty uh that they start to offer yeah those programs uh, I'm not sure if there's anyone from Visa or MasterCard on the line, so I'll watch what I say. I don't care. Uh, no, but they're, Visa and MasterCard are, are, are payments driven. They, they operate through payments terminals. Uh, so any rewards that they can do are limited to the amount of money that you spend. They're not integrated to the point of sale on a product level like we are. So if Stephen rang up Visa and said, I want to do rewards where everybody gets a free coffee, they wouldn't be able to do it. So they're trying to retrofit 
rewards onto their existing payments rails, which is good because they have ludicrous scale. But, you know, they're a shotgun and we're a rifle, you know, like we can pinpoint things, they can just splash it out everywhere. We're Visa and MasterCard are doing great things in other spaces, but their rewards are limited by the fact that they operate on payments terminals and can only sure. deal with amounts of money spent. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, Stephen, question for you. Um, uh, do you think we'll eventually see a trend of Starbucks insomnia closing down as a result of people supporting more intimate modern coffee shops like Bear Market slash Coffee Angel? Um, <laughs> I think we uh, we'll see a bit of it. Um, I think definitely the last few months has driven that home. Um, like you know, I'm just talking here in Black Rock. There's five or six um, small coffee shops, all doing really really well. There's a Starbucks up the road, and it's not doing great at all. So I I think. I think this is a slow bleed for the for the bigger chains and it's been going on for years whereby people's palates are changing they're getting exposed to better quality products better quality coffees um more locally produced products and slowly people are moving away from that i think it has ramped up recently i think the last year or two we've really seen that ramp up and i know it's in town now there's a few starbucks locations that have closed um, so yeah, yeah. Long story short, I think I think you will. Now, at the same time, if I was in, in charge of one of those chains, I think there's a lot of things they could do to stay competitive, um, quite easily, because they they have very very strong brand presence and uh, people do love brands. So they they can they can stay competitive and they can definitely fight back. Um, but I think at the moment the the trend is definitely moving towards the more local artisan um, retailers. Sure. Okay. Uh, here's a question, um, probably for both of you, but I'll, I'll ask it first, for Patrick. So, uh, so working from home is becoming an increasing phenomenon. Okay. Uh, maybe when the vaccine comes out, life will go back to normal. But so, Patrick, just in the meantime. Um, would you consider partnering or integrating with the home delivery brands? So Deliveroo, Uber Eats, Just Eat, something like that. And then I suppose just as, you know, as working from home kind of becomes the norm for the foreseeable future, um, I think it's a trend that coffee shops and restaurants, Stephen, might move towards as well. So maybe Patrick. Can... Stephen and I have chatted about this. Uh, the, the Uber Eats and the Deliveroo's won't work with us because, uh, we don't charge enough money for them. So like the logic is like our fees uh, are minuscule in comparison to those from Uber Eats or um, Deliveroo. Like their, their USP, the actual technology to make an order online can be built by a very small team. The logistics of running all of those delivery dudes around the town, that's a much bigger business. So like Deliveroo, their technology isn't ordering the food online. The technology is like most of their engineering efforts, and I'm guessing here, but educated guess, most of their engineering effort goes on making their drivers more efficient and getting them around town more. And that's their USP. That's the reason businesses pay them 30% because they're coming into your business and saying, hey, we'll, we'll order 500 euros or 1,000 euros worth every day. The businesses pay it through gritted teeth, but if they have an alternative, they will take it. So our fees are a fraction of that, but unfortunately we can't offer bear market delivery. But what bear market, we do have the functionality that we do have delivery. So you could put in your home address and we can pinpoint that. We just don't have the driver. So the businesses like Stephen have the option to either, what may happen in the future is businesses having their own cyclists or drivers doing local deliveries rapid for them or third party companies. There's one or two already. Uh, it's just a matter of whether they can make the economics work. Third party companies will come into the space to work with the likes of us. So bear market would choose a certain company. That company would say, yeah, we work with the Loyalap API. So when an order in Loyalap comes in, they get informed of it, their driver comes in and, they're, and, and they collect it. So 
that's kind of how I see it going. I, I see these companies coming in and servicing the likes of us uh, because it's not just coffee and food we do as well. Like we also do a lot of retail. You know, our vision is that if you see a book online right now, like I don't want you going to Amazon. I want you searching in Loyal app to try and find that book and finding a local retailer in town that has it. Uh, and then the next step is that retailer also has an integration with a delivery company and David has his book in three hours, you know, from a local business, not three days mm -hmm. from Amazon. He may pay a little bit more, but you're paying a little bit more to have something in three hours, you know, that immediate satisfaction and the feel good factor that you're supporting local and the money is staying in your circular economy like that. Every economy in the world is driving that moment. They're just petrified of the amount of money leaving their circular economies. Yeah. All right, thank what you. What do you think about the delivery, Stephen? Sorry, what was the yes. second half of the question for Stephen? Um, uh, same, similar thing in terms of, so as a, as a merchant then, uh, this increase in work from home, so people are getting things delivered as opposed to venturing out uh, through a lockdown or extended lockdowns or, or even just how their habits might change, you know, if they get used to um, just having stuff delivered increasingly as opposed to making in-store visits. Yeah, well, we've seen a funny trend. <laughs> Obviously, all our city centre locations are are closed, are pretty much closed. Um, whereas the suburbs have gone the opposite way. So the suburbs are seeing great numbers. Um, like Black Rock is busier than it's it's ever been, and as a village, it's it's really really busy. So with our product with coffee. Um, there is a certain social aspect that's ingrained in that. It's not just the products. We can, we can all make coffee at home. And if we put our mind to it, we can make really good coffee at home. Um, but I think there's a certain uh, element to it, which is just getting out of the house. It's going for a bit of a walk. It's clearing the head. It's a bit of headspace. It's maybe meeting someone and having a quick coffee and a quick natter. So I think there'll always be a market for that. Um, and there'll always be a market for pure convenience coffee at home. And that's something we're also working at on our online side of the business is trying to cater for that because we've seen say our online sales and our retail coffee sales spike quite a lot and that's people at home making, making coffee so we're, we're trying to balance between the two um with regards to direct delivery of our our product i.e a hot americano there's obviously intrinsic <laughs> difficulties with that in terms of spilling a hot coffee on, on someone or when you get it it's going to be cold and all um kind of <laughs> out of sync so I, i'm not convinced on that yet i know there's a few people that are trying drone deliveries of coffee and i'd actually i'd love to try it um but there's a good bit to go yet um so i don't i don't know if it's going to, i think it'd be more a bit of a, a gimmick than anything else um i think there is there is other options we could have nodes and kind of in 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 residential areas where people come out and get a coffee from a, a node let's say which might be a, a truck or a, a even a bike with an espresso machine on it but um but no i don't i don't think the model is going to shift to to home delivery straight away sure okay great um i think it in the interest of time i think we'll, we'll i'd like to thank you both for join us. I think we'll leave it there. Um, um, and uh, I'd like to thank you both, uh, Patrick and Stephen, for taking the time to join us and give us some uh, insightful and interesting talks. Um, and to thank everyone else who joined us and participated. Um, I suppose for those who are interested, uh, Transform, the startup and scale-up will continue for the rest of the week until Friday, uh, the same time every week. Tomorrow, Wednesday, we have Professor Maura McAdam, who will be discussing her research in um, entrepreneurship and gender. Uh, and that's also part of the parallel series of SDG 4B, which focuses on SDG 5 uh, gender equality. Okay, uh, On Thursday, we'll have Dr. Catherine O'Keefe of Castlebridge. And then on Friday, we have Daniel Kine, founder and CEO of Opinion X, Kira Sheehan, founder of Orb Media, and Wendy Slattery, uh, co-founder and CEO of Beauty Buddy. And they will discuss the challenges and opportunities in running uh, a startup in COVID. Um, the next Transform series, you'll probably hear this before the end of the week, but I'll say it anyway, 
in case this is the last one you listen to this week. It will continue in December, so December 7th, and that theme will be the future of work. So we'll be sending around new registration links through uh, Dublin uh, DC Business School and the Dot Lab channel. So keep an eye out for that. Um, if you'd like to join us in the meantime, thank you again to our speakers, Patrick and Stephen. And to everyone, uh, stay safe, stay well. Thanks for joining us. And I'll see you next time. Thank you. Take care. Thanks, David. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks.